Hello and welcome everyone. Um, welcome to the Honors College Winter Undergraduate Research Showcase. My name is Tony Doolin. I'm the Dean of the Honors College and I'm very excited that so many members of our community have joined us for what I think is gonna be a wonderful evening of presentations. Uh, before we begin, the first thing that I want to do is acknowledge that Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon is located within the traditional homelands of the Mary's River or Ampinafu Band of the Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, Kalapuya people were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, living descendants of these people are part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. You may have noticed that we're recording the presentations today. The final video will be edited to remove any identifying information of those of you who are attending as, ga as guests before we share or post that information. We always have some folks that are unable to attend the event and ask to, to see a recording of it, but we're glad that so many of you could join us tonight. Before our students begin, it's my great pleasure to welcome Oregon State University Interim President Becky Johnson to give some opening remarks. Dr. Johnson has been with Oregon State since 1984, joining as a faculty member in the College of Forestry. She has served in a number of leadership roles in her time at OSU and has been instrumental in some of the most transformative initiatives at the university in the last 20 years. In 2002, she led the university's efforts to write its first strategic plan. And in 2008, she directed the implementation of Into OSU the first public-private partnership driving internationalization efforts at the university. Beginning in 2009, she served as the vice president of OSU Cascades and Bend, and under her leadership, OSU Cascades progressed from an academic degree transfer program based at Central Oregon Community College to a four-year university with its own campus. In 2021, she was appointed interim president of Oregon State University, and we're very fortunate in the Honors College to enjoy the support of all of our senior leaders. And I'm honored to be able to welcome Interim President Johnson here today. Thank you so much for joining us. And Becky, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Tony. And thanks for all of your contributions to the growth and the success of the Honors College. As you know, as a internationally recognized public research university, it's really important for us to attract students who are motivated to achieve at the highest level and the Honors College really helps us to do that. The growth of the Honors College continues to be strong. And this fall, the Honors College enrollment grew by 3.7%, enrolling more than 1,500 students. And that represents 5.6% of all OSU undergraduates. And the excellence of Honors College applicants has continued to rise as well with an average unweighted high school GPA of 3.91. A primary goal of the university's strategic plan is to advance student success by providing a transformative educational experience for all learners. And the undergraduate research experience in the Honors College is a great example of that. Completion of a research or creative thesis on an original topic in an academic field is a requirement of earning an Honors College degree. And tonight's research showcase presents a wonderful opportunity for students to share those experiences. Honors College student research is done at a very high level and it frequently informs or is the basis for publications in professional journals. For example, Joe O'Hara with us tonight is a senior mathematics major with minors in computer science and philosophy. And she's engaged in research projects at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, Yale University and here at Oregon State. She's taken on a leadership role in creating a more diverse, inclusive and equitable culture in her field. As vice president and now president of the OSU Math Club, as an officer in the Oregon State University chapter of the Association for Women in Mathematics, and through her volunteer engagements, Jo demonstrates the ideal of an honor student who uses exceptional talents and abilities to inspire far-reaching community change. Jo is one of tonight's presenters. And Seth Pinckney, who graduated last year, began research as a freshman and ultimately co-authored two papers on the structure of the COVID-19 virus and is now working in a dialysis clinic while preparing to enter graduate school. These types of transformative experiences are a hallmark of the excellence of an honors college education at Oregon State. 
So congratulations to all of OSU's impressive students for the outstanding research and scholarship work they pursue through the Honors College. Thank you. Thank you so much, President Johnson. Now it is my great pleasure to welcome our eight student presenters. This is actually our fifth research, research showcase event, and I never cease to be amazed at both the quality of the work and the diversity of the work that honor students are engaged in. The opportunity to participate in original research and creative work is a foundational element of the Honors College experience with a transformative impact on students. But as you, you will see and hear, Honors undergraduates are also making real contributions to their fields and to the university, and I would argue um, to the world. So what we've asked each student to do is to speak very briefly for about three to five minutes about their work. And we're gonna go through all eight talks without a break. And then after everyone is finished, we're going to split into four different breakout rooms with two students in each of the breakout rooms. You all have been pre-assigned to a starting room, but you will be able to leave and basically visit other rooms so that you'll have a chance to visit with uh, any of the students that you want to. And the good news is, uh, while many of us are familiar with the breakout room feature of Zoom, if that's something that's new to you, uh, Gordon Fenn will remain in this main room and help you get into any breakout room that you want to go into so that you can um, join a particular student. And then in the chat, we're also going to post the link to a website with all the slides and, and titles and a list of the speakers that are in each of the rooms. And so without, we've, we've learned on these, there's so much great um, information in the presentations and so much desire for conversation that we're gonna go directly into the presentations. Next up, we have Claire J. Rick Rama. Hello, I'm Claire. I am a junior bioengineering student and I've been working in the labs of Dr. Stephen Giovannoni in microbiology and Francis Chan in integrative biology. So, one sec. Off the Oregon coast, hypoxic zones form seasonally in the water. Hypo means low and oxia refers to oxygen. These areas have low oxygen concentrations. Organisms that use oxygen to breathe, like crabs and fish, have oxygen requirements to survive. But when oxygen levels drop below these thresholds, they can experience massive die-offs, like shown here with the crabs. Ocean deoxygenation is projected to increase in severity due to climate change, and it's got national attention, like in this article featuring Francis published in 2021. But hypoxia is difficult to predict from year to year, and our models that attempt to understand oxygen dynamics may be based on an incomplete understanding of how marine microbes consume oxygen. It is commonly thought that the only thing microbes use oxygen for is respiration, which is analogous to human breathing. And this leads some to conclude that the hypoxic regions are caused by microbes simply respiring more oxygen than the photosynthetic plankton are producing. However, microbes use oxygen not only for cellular respiration, but also in catabolic processes or in the breakdown of compounds. So my research aims to define how microbes function in low oxygen concentrations. Will microbes in hypoxic zones be able to carry out these cellular functions? Can they respire and break down compounds just the same? Or will their respiratory and catabolic activity suffer like we see in crabs and fish? So let's think about marine microbes for a second. For one, there's great diversity of microscopic life in the ocean. You may think the ocean is just a homogenous soup, but if you think on a microbial scale, like a teeny tiny microbe, there's a lot going on biochemically that these cells have to navigate in order to survive. Fluctuating oxygen concentrations is just one of those challenges. In order to further understand oxygenase enzymes that break down compounds, we use a biochemical approach by employing a Michaelis-Menten curve. Here's oxygen concentration on the, y, on the X axis and respiration on the Y axis. Traditionally, when scientists measure oxygen loss, they assume the oxygen is used in respiration. 
But really this respiration rate on the y-axis is lumping together multiple processes, including our catabolic processes carried out by oxygenase enzymes. Understanding how enzymes work can be complicated, but try to imagine an enzyme binding to a substrate. Think Pac-Man. It can either bind quickly, meaning it has a high affinity, or it can take longer to bind, meaning the enzyme has a lower affinity for whatever it's binding to, in our case, oxygen. Different enzymes have different affinities, and we can quantify this affinity using a Km value. If we look at the green line as an example, a low Km indicated with the green arrow means that the enzyme has a higher affinity for oxygen, so it can bind oxygen at a higher rate. So the goal of my project is to create a curve like this Michaelis-Menten curve. And that way we can determine how microbial enzymes function when they experience the low oxygen concentrations in the ocean. So in order to do this, we had to recreate low oxygen conditions in the lab. And this was a challenge because we had to figure out how to manipulate seawater to eight different oxygen levels to produce a nice curve. We designed an experiment where I'm able to collect water, grow marine microbes in the lab, and control the oxygen concentration by mixing different volumes of high and low oxygen water to hit intermediate target levels. So for example, mixing zero micromolar and 300 micromolar at equal volumes gives a concentration of 150 micromolar. But then I use an oxygen sensor to measure the rate of oxygen loss to plot, but we're still perfecting our methods. So determining, determining a KM value will help me answer my- That's all for now, let's question. do this again tomorrow will help me answer my scientific question, which is broadly speaking, whether microbial function depends on the concentration of oxygen. In more technical terms, how does hypoxia affect microbial function by slowing down oxygenase enzymes? While I don't have data that's ready to share today, we're working on improving our system so we can run another experiment this summer. Ocean deoxygenation is one of the most pernicious yet underreported side effects of human-induced climate change. The volume of ocean waters completely depleted of oxygen has quadrupled since the 1960s. So this data, which forms a subset of Sarah's PhD work, could ultimately allow us to better forecast global ocean deoxygenation in order to prevent the loss of marine biodiversity and collapse of fisheries. This work was funded by Bioscope and the Sheila Van Zant Summer Scholarship, and I would like to thank all members of the Giovanoni Lab, especially Sarah Wolf and my co-advisors, Steve and Francis. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Next, we have Joe O'Harrell. Hey, hi, I'm Joe, and I'm gonna be talking about Diversion Spam in Minkowski space. This is honors thesis work done jointly by myself and my mentor, Tevi and Dre. Um, so there's actually two sides to my project. One of them is a qualitative side where we're going to be asking, is math, after it's been situated within like Western logical systems, truly objective? And there's four components for looking at that. One of them is looking at the process versus outcome sort of fixation present in our field. One of them is looking at the ethics and lives of mathematicians outside of the work that they do at, like in math. Um, another one is looking at the relationship people have to abstract structures in mathematics. And then the last component is looking at how institutional structures either enable or inhibit people from actually doing math. And all of this is sort of spun off of and complementary to a geometric side, where we're actually going to be working out the details of divergence theorem as a vector calculus result in Minkowski space. So on the qualitative side, some of the questions we might ask are what mental devices, including potentially images, symbols, or keystone examples, do you use to relate to groups? How has this affected your proof approaches? And then another question, and this would be directed to mathematicians in my field, would be what, if anything, do you gain from spending time on an ultimately fruitless proof approach? And so switching gears to look at the quantitative or 
mathematical side of what we're doing, um, we start with a notion of Euclidean three space. And we can kind of think of that abstractly as like the space we live in. So it's ultimately three, the threefold Cartesian product of the real numbers. And it's like the X, Y, Z plane from vector calculus, if you took that. So given Euclidean three space, you can take any point in it and assign it a vector that has three dimensions. And if you do that, what you end up with is a vector field. Given a vector field in Euclidean three space and a surface, we can define flux by looking at the outward unit normal at every point on that surface and taking the dot product of that vector with the vector at each point from the vector field and then integrate across the whole surface and that's flux. Now, if you look at this box in the picture I have, we can compute flux for any box by just summing across the flux for each individual surface. And so here we would just add up this flux for each of the six sides. Now, divergence is defined at points, not for entire surfaces. But how we arrive at that is by making this box infinitely small. So we keep computing flux over and over and over and then look at the limiting behavior as it gets tiny. And so in Euclidean three space, we have a result that the integral of flux over the boundary of a compact set is equal to integrating the divergence through the whole mass of that set. And what we wanna do is look at this in Minkowski three space. So we know this is gonna be true, but there's some weird details to work out. And the reason why is that even though in Minkowski three space, we have the same exact underlying set, the same you know, like ambient space we're working in, we actually measure distance completely differently. And you can see how that's done by, we switch out the Z vector for something called the T vector. And that's a reference from special relativity because that is time, but that's kind of a side detail. The dot products are pretty much what we would expect for X and Y and the ones that aren't equal with themselves are zero, except the dot product of T with itself is negative one. And this actually ends up resulting in a totally different calculation for divergence. You can see what we've calculated for that here on the right. Um, and the questions we have left to work out are in the divergence theorem, what signs are affected and where does our outward normal vector point? So that's what's in progress. Thank you so much, Joe. And now I will welcome Alice Lulich. All right. So hello, everyone. I hope everyone's having a good day. Um, I'm just going to give a quick little talk about my research with um, synthesis characterization and application of bismuth carboxylate metal organic frameworks. So what is a metal organic framework? So a metal organic framework is an extended structure that it consists of a metal node. So that can be a transition metal or post transition metal. We chose bismuth because it has a UV properties and um, it is low toxicity, which is strange for its um, high uh, molecular weight and um, place in the periodic table. And then um, these are connected via um, organic linkers. So that's something consisting of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, um, hydrogen, and it extends in a framework structure where you have the metal node then you have a linker and that can go in one dimension, two dimensions or three dimensions. And so these are highly versatile structures because you can use basically whatever you want. They are very robust and they you can make crystals out of them to characterize them and then utilize them for things. So if, as you can see in the figure on the right, we have a bismuth moth that is used in photocatalysis. So it essentially takes energy from the sunlight and splits water into hydrogen gas, which can then be used and burned as clean fuel. So that is a promising kind of green energy solution. And then on the right um, is work from Dr. Kiriako Stilianu's lab, um, which is another lab in the chemistry department. And that takes um, molecules like methane or carbon dioxide and converts them into more useful molecules that we could also use for um, clean sources. So um, MOFs in general have very um, wide variety of uses from uh, medicine, to these kind of clean energy materials to waste management. So that's a major reason why we looked into them for this presentation. No, for this, um, for my research. 
So what I found, I found 12 new carboxylate MOFs and I fully characterized them all, but um, I will be mainly focusing on one of them today just for sake of time. Um, so we did, since this crystal grows in room temperature, we did a time study on this crystal growth. So you can see in the top picture that on day zero, we have these small crystallites and they eventually aggregate to these large needle-like structures. So we studied these using scanning electron micro microscope. We also use powder X-ray diffraction and other methods to track this crystal growth. And so on the next slide, you can see we have also fully characterized these crystals and we did this for all 12, but this is just um, the bismuth chain that we did. So uh, as you can see, we have this chain of bismuth in this 3D structural representation, which is connected by these um, tetrafluoro terephthalic acid linkers. So those carboxylates are linking the bismuth together. And then we have those four fluorines there. Here's a side on view. Um, so you can kind of see more of the structure and how it's connected to the bismuth. The powder XRD is what matches our 3D structural representation with the bulk material. And based on the fact that there isn't um, any extraneous peaks and the intensities seem to match, we can assume that our crystal is one has this identity and also it is pure. In the FTIR, we can also see that the, there's a carboxylate shift, which also is further proof that the um, carboxylate is connected to the metal. And then the TGA shows the um, stability of our MOF. So we did this for all 12 of the crystals that I found. And then the application that we chose to use was dye absorption. So we used a um, dye called um, methylene blue, which is a high um, positive molecule. And as you can see before, we have this colored solution. And then after um, our MOF um, took the dye out of the solution and we tracked that using UV viz. And so this could potentially be used in kind of a waste management solution and trying to remove positive ions from like uh, wastewater since our product is stable in water. So um, for future directions for me, I'm going to be finishing up my research in my last term. Um, I'm also going to be writing papers, which would include my thesis work. And then I plan to go to grad school and do work in inorganic chemistry. Um, thank you all for listening to me and hope to see you in the breakout rooms. Thank you so much, Alice. Next, we have Lorenzo Curtis. Everybody, my name is Lorenzo Curtis. I am a fourth year ecological engineer um, minoring in Spanish. So I'm a native Spanish speaker, meaning it was my first language. I'd like to thank my mother for that skill. It's my greatest blessing. And uh, my thesis aims to employ my skill specifically to help support um, underrepresented Latino uh, students and their families in Oregon. Um, so my idea came about like this. So I've been an Honors College Student Ambassador for about four years now, and I've attended a lot of events where I serve as a representative for the university. And one of the most impactful events I actually have ever attended was a Latino Family Night uh, at Hillsborough High School in November of 2019. The photo on the right side of your screen is a photo of me with really long hair um, next to my three younger siblings, Andres, Emilio, and Daniela. And I was really excited to go to this event because it's always exciting to do tabling especially in Spanish so I could practice my vocabulary. So while I was tabling, one of the first things I noticed was the massive age range of people present. I would see toddlers and strollers and elders on walkers and every age demographic in between. It was really impressive. And naturally, because of the crowd there, there was Mexican food being catered. So I noticed the families would go and get food, they'd feed their kids, and then they'd walk over to my table and ask me questions. One thing I noticed about the questions they were asking me is that they're kind of like second nature type of questions. They were asking questions like, is there a separate application for the honors college? And what benefits do you yield from being an honors student? And the reason I say it's second nature is because in my social sphere with my peers and colleagues, these things are almost implicitly known. So they don't really come up in conversation as much. Um, but anyways, I went, I went ahead and answered their questions, obviously with my own personal anecdotes my own personal experiences, tips and tricks. And to my surprise, they were really responsive to this. And that actually elicited further questioning and deeper uh, picking of my brain, I guess. So my experience at this event showed me that Latino students and families tend to understand information better when it's communicated through anecdotes and personal experiences and storytelling. And in Spanish, there's a word for this, it's called testimonios, which in English means testimonies. 
and testimonials are rich in cultural knowledge and information, uh, despite not being numerical or analytical like the majority of STEM research. Testimonials include valuable experiences that not only shape who we are as Latinos, but also how we interact with and navigate the world around us. And in my opinion, it's not just the short research I've been doing the past six months, I believe that we do need to incorporate testimonials into our educational sphere to not only expand our lens of understanding, but our lens of inclusivity. So you fast forward from this photo three years and my thesis is finally materializing. So my thesis is going to be a personal testimonial of my experience as a Latino student in STEM here at Oregon State University. I believe there's a need for this type of cultural information because Latinx students are among the least and most poorly represented at our university. I also believe it's part of my duty to use my platform to distribute information to Latinx students and their families that they're gonna actually be responsive to. So the intended audience for my project is going to be the Latinx family unit. And for my brief anecdote I mentioned earlier, um, you may have deduced that these families make decisions together as a conglomerate, as a unit. It's a beautiful thing. And they also celebrate victories together. So my testimonial will be taking shape of uh, a video series uh, with a series of videos where I break down different parts of my collegiate experience. I'm very blessed and very thankful that, that the pre-college programs and the SMILE programs are going to be supporting my video endeavors. I'm really looking forward to what we can produce together. The videos are going to be fully in Spanish and they're going to have English translation and subtitles so that the rest of you all can also enjoy them. Uh, the written portion of my thesis is going to explore my personal experiences a bit more in depth um, while also aligning my project with university initiatives and also proving that my series has cultural value. So the overall goal of my project is really just to show young Latinx students and their families that si se puede. Yes, it can be done. It is possible. College is well within reach and you do belong here. So as far as next steps, I I'm going to be filming my video series in the springtime, hopefully capturing the beautiful weather that we enjoy here in Corvallis. And beyond that, I'll be putting together my written thesis and also defending in the fall. Um, I'm looking forward to all of your questions in the breakout rooms. I'll be in breakout room number three. Thank you for your eyes, ears, and your time. Gracias. Thank you, Lorenzo. Next, we have Andrea Perez. Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Andrea and I'm going to present this project. Um, it is a pleasure of mine uh, to be with you all today. Um, I'm happy to present for a second time um, a project I spent my entire summer, summer working on as an intern of the Honors College. Um, okay. Um, okay. So it is called Healthcare Merit Matters, um, ensuring access to new and emerging psychedelic therapies for Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. Um, my mentor was um, Dr. Stuart Starbecker from the School of History, Philosophy, and Religion. Okay. So first of all, I wanted to point out that mental health was something that was um, difficult to balance um, during hard times, such as the pandemic. So as we see, um, one in five Americans experienced some kind of depression or anxiety during the 2020 year and so on. Um, however, after the pandemic started and, and continued so on, about one third of the population's mental health was affected. So as well, Oregon's mental health crisis is considered to be one of the most severe ones in the country. So what has this to do with emergent therapies and also with BIPOC communities? So first of all, emergent therapies are the are those therapies that are um, that are um, in reference to psilocybin, to ketamines, and other examples of emergent therapies. Um, my, the goal of my project is to explain why these therapies have a great benefit to the mental health of BIPOC communities who are the groups that were most affected during the pandemic, and also other groups that would need these services. According to many experts, um, I had an interview with experts such as Dr. Alan Davis from Ohio State University and Christopher from OHSU. Emergent therapies are considered to be a potential alternative for any person who could need it. Also facilitate the access to BIPOC communities who were the most affected during the pandemic. There are many efforts right now, oh, sorry. There are many efforts right now being done since 2022 legalize the use of psilocybin and also develop a regulatory structure to provide and facilitate it for the ones that really need it. 
For example, we can, we can see right now a quote that says, due to the pervasive nature of racism, developing effective approaches to addressing racial trauma should become a priority and psychedelics are a promising avenue. So um, different issues such as racism and also trauma and rough issues that had to do with the pandemic affected very much our BIPOC communities. So some of them need these services. And right now, psychedelic therapies are something somehow controversial for our communities and also for the state. So I think we should support this idea as a possible, as a potential, um, as a potential solution to help improve the mental health of these groups. So as a result of the constant literature review and the communication I had with experts in psychedelic therapies and psychedelic medicine, um, I became more aware of the potential benefits of psychedelic treatments and the promising mental health improvements for BIPOC communities and everyone else in Oregon State. So some of the next steps in the future I plan to do is to continue my research at my thesis project with Dr. Sarbacker and build more connections with these physicians that would like to educate better um, Oregon State and the rest of the country about the benefits of psychedelic therapies. And also um, learn more about how to contribute to a better literacy about these topics. Because there's still some, you know, some different controversies about these. And some of them, some people think they're bad or maybe not that beneficial, but I think we should contribute to change that um, that thought and start thinking of it as a possible alternative for an improvement in mental health. So, well, I think right now, personally, I believe that this project has been really, um, I don't know, has been really impactful for me because um, as a microbiology major, as a science major, I never thought I would be so involved in mental health. And I don't know, I think learning about it has, has opened another door that, <laughs> that really opened a passion for me for mental health. So I, I'm really thankful for that. So thank you. I really hope to hear about your questions. I'll be in breakout room three. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Andrea. Uh, next, we have Lucas Parvin. All right. Hello, everyone. I am Lucas Parvin, as you were just told. And today I will be talking to you about my thesis, which is currently titled How Blue Fluorescent Targets Influence Bee Movement and Flower Visitation Rate in Floral Poor Agricultural Environments, which is quite the mouthful, and I'm sure it will change in the coming months. So as many already know, every time a bee lands on a flower and pollinates it, more seeds can be produced. For plants that produce fruit, more seeds are directly correlated with their fruit size and quality. So the more a plant is pollinated by bees, the more fruit it will produce. In the United States alone, bees pollinate approximately 75% of all fruits, vegetables, and nuts grown every year and are responsible for generating billions of dollars worth of produce annually. However, bee populations are declining worldwide and in the <clears throat> sorry, and the need for their services are increasing with a growing human population. Studies show that bees are attracted to blue fluorescent light emissions and using blue fluorescent traps to catch bees is a common practice in the study uh, in the study of bee populations. In floral poor agricultural environments where bee communities are not well understood at this time, this begs the question could blue fluorescent targets reasonably be used to increase pollination rates and thus crop yield in agricultural practices? In attempting to answer this question, I networked with some grass seed farmers this past summer and was granted access to 10 grass seed fields. On these 10 fields, I conducted, conducted two separate field experiments designed to learn about bee populations. Excuse the dog in the back, I'm sorry. Uh, in these floral poor environments and how their attraction to blue fluorescent light may vary with stimulus <clears throat> vary with stimulus size and distance. During three separate sampling periods, I placed blue vein traps, also known as BVTs, uh, on T posts that were established in these grass seed fields. Each T post was placed either 50 meters from the edge of a field or 200 meters away from the edge of a field, and each sampling site consisted of a high stimulus group which can be seen on this screen with three BVTs 
or a low stimulus group, which is just one BVT, so as to determine how the size of the stimulus and distance from field edges may affect the degree to which bees are attracted to blue fluorescent targets. Uh, and to keep sampling sites as independent from one another as possible for the sake of this research, a minimum of 200 meters separated each site. Field sizes range from 20 hectares to approximately 85 hectares. So the number of sites per field was not constant, uh, ranging from three to six total sites per field. During the three sampling periods, I caught approximately 1,500 specimens. And after washing, drying, pinning, and labeling each one, I sent them to Lincoln Best, a bee taxonomist on campus for species level identification. And then in my second field experiment, I simply paired cut sunflowers at T-posts with either a blue vein or a clear vein and recorded them for bee visitation. A total of 20 sites were filmed for two hours each. And re when recording was concluded, I watched all 40 hours of footage and quantified the amount of bee visitation at each flower. So I'm currently waist deep in data analysis and statistical modeling, which has been slow going due to the learning curve that our studio presents. Uh, however, as indicated by an ANOVA test and post hoc analysis, I have found that capture rates varied between BVT sites dependent on stimulus size and distance from field edges. Uh, regression analyses indicate that the stimulus size of the blue fluorescent emissions played a larger role in whether or not bees will venture into floral poor environments than uh, distance from field edges, at least pertaining to the differences uh, um, in, dis in distance that I used of 50 meters and 200 meters. And then this is also demonstrated by the top figure to the right, which shows the mean daily bee capture rate of each group through the three sampling periods. Uh, furthermore, in my analysis of the sunflower bee visitation data, it is clear that blue fluorescent targets increase visitation rate at sunflowers as indicated by the bottom figure to the right. And uh, ultimately, I'm still developing my RStudio skills and have much more data analysis and modeling to do. Uh, but from my results so far, it appears as if blue fluorescent targets could be used in agricultural areas to increase pollination, and that the larger the stimulus size of targets, the better. Oh, no, let's go back. All right, so lastly, I'd like to extend my thanks to my mentor, Dr. Jim Rivers, for all the support throughout my thesis. I'm not quite done yet, but I'm very happy about where it is at right now. I'd also like to thank the Honors College for putting together this event and giving, the me giving me the means to conduct meaningful research as an undergrad student. Thank you. Here are some references. Thank you so much, Lucas. And for our final presentation, I'd like to welcome Francesca Rossi. All right. Hello, um, my name is Francesca. I'm a third year animal science major um, in the Honors College. Um, and today I'm going to be presenting on the association of arrogate alkaloid profiles to insect performance on grass cultivars. Next slide, please. Um, I think, yeah, there we go. Um, so what does that title mean? Well, the objective of this project was to identify grass seed varieties that contain a bioactive compound from a fungal endophyte known as a mycotoxin. And we're looking for grass, grasses with high levels of mycotoxins that are toxic to insects, but low levels of those that are toxic to mammals with the ultimate goal of finding grasses that are naturally pest resistant, but safe for herbivores like livestock that might graze them. This project is particularly important in Oregon, the grass seed capital of the world, since it's estimated that 75% of world grass seed production occurs here. Next slide, please. So what's an endophyte? An endophyte is that little squiggle that the white arrow is pointing to. And it's a fungi that lives within the plant cells as part of a symbiotic relationship. Plants don't have legs, so when something comes along and wants to nibble on it, whether it's an herbivore or a bug, they can't run away. So instead, they've developed these fungal endophytes that protect the plant by producing metabolites that are going to deter those predators. This can be a good thing because some of this, these metabolites, known as mycotoxins, such as the ergoline alkaloids, are toxic to insects, and these act as natural insecticides. Those are the ones that are on the top. However, this can also be problematic, seen as ergot alkaloids, a type of mycotoxins that is toxic to mammals, um, can be really harmful to our livestock and even to us when we try to eat these plants that are affected. Next slide, please. So why do we need these grasses to produce um, insecticides when we already have synthetic pesticides? 
Well, apart from just creating a more sustainable agricultural approach to pesticides, there's also this insect known as the sod webworm that's been identified as one of the most destructive species to organ grass seeds operations. The sod webworm larvae eat away at the crowns of grasses and they result in yellowing, thinning and poor fall regrowth. Most of the pesticides that are designed to target these larvae are expensive with some costing up to $15 an acre and must be applied with rainfall to ensure proper translocation or application to the roots. Most of the approved pesticides um, that are used in the Willamette Valley are not as effective as they need to be to combat the sod webworm. Next slide, please. So enter our study. Our study consisted of 32 grass cultivars that were grown under standard greenhouse conditions with a 16 to eight hour photo period. They were comprised of tall fescue, fine fescue, orchard grass, and perennial ryegrass. These are all grass species that are commonly grown in the Willamette Valley for seed. These samples were then cut and hand ground, which was probably the hardest part of this whole project. Um, and then they were analyzed via the Soyuk multi-mycotoxin method. While we analyzed the samples, we were looking for ergot alkaloids. So those are the ones toxic to mammals, ergoline alkaloids, those toxic to insects, and the compound paramine. We used a mass spectrometer, which is the picture down at the bottom. Um, and we quantified our results against a commercial, commercially available standard. Next slide, please. So this table shows the concentration of the ergot alkaloids, the ergoline alkaloids, paramine concentration, and the insect mortality. As you can see, tall fescue and orchard grass were our top two when it came to insect mortality, with orchard grass being on top. Um, however, you'll see that it came in second when it comes to ergoline alkaloid concentrations, and it was beat out by fine fescue, which had the highest ergoline and paramine concentrations, but interestingly had the lowest insect mortality. The standard deviation is so high in all of these samples due to the fact that mycotoxin profiles can vary greatly between samples, which isn't unusual because they each have different genes and are subject to different environmental pressures. Next slide, please. So on the left, you'll see a total ion chromatogram, and that's the data that the mass spec spits out for us, and it's visually representing all of the compounds that we're screening for. So when we delve into specific mycotoxins, we found that individual plant species with over 50% insect mortality had higher elevated levels of paramine and chenoclavine. These are both compounds of interest because they've been known to be naturally occurring insecticides while having low mammalian toxicity, with paramine being particularly potent in New Zealand in combating the Argentine stem weevil. Um, next slide, please. This project is part of the greater goal to better understand and preserve the benefits of endophyte crops within organ grass seeds industry. Right now, endophytes kind of have a stigma attached to them because they do have um, the toxic effects to some mammals. However, as we saw in this study, they can actually be very useful as a naturally occurring insecticide. We're also hoping to continue to use them to combat insect damage and can be an alternative pest management approach. Future work on this project is to further understand the relationship between ergot alkaloid profiles and insect performance on grass seed species in their cultivars in Oregon with the potential application for CRISPR or other gene modification mechanisms to alter fungal expression. So basically in the future, we're hoping that we can find a way to turn on the insecticides, but turn off those that are potentially toxic to mammals. Next slide. I'd like to say a quick thank you to my collaborators and my funding sources, and I'll be in breakout room if you have any questions, and thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Francesca, and thank you to all eight of our presenters.